thank you for joining. Um, so Gavin has been on before, but it was kind of during lockdown, which was very different, uh, <laughs> I'm sure for you. Yeah. So, um, and uh, Stephen, you're new to this, but we're just gonna get started. It's, you know, we, it's, we do, ed- it's live, but we do edit it. So nothing's off base, nothing you can say, do whatever. Uh, uh, of course, we're gonna pick and choose all the worst moments. Um, to put live, uh, but uh, you know, you can you can uh, say it and do whatever you want. Um, so five and thirty again. We're on our third season, which is a little bit crazy. We started in the pandemic, trying to you know, LBB really wanted to kind of reach out to uh, America, and with lockdown, nobody could meet anybody, nobody could see eat anybody. So we came up with this idea of like really talking about you know having five questions that had nothing to do with advertising knowing that it was going to eventually come back to advertising because what do we do we we live our work and work our li- our lives so um uh anyway I'm really happy to have you guys on so um I just want to make sure that I have everybody's uh name so I'm just going to start with the introduction I'm going to start with you Gavin Gavin Lester you're a partner and CCO at Zimbezi LLC in Los Angeles well Is that's that- that, that is correct. I love that. You still are that. I know. Did they, did they give you any other it? titles? <laughs> you made it through uh, the pandemic. You should ask for another title. Yeah, I don't know. Survivor. Survivor yep, of the yeah. pandemic. <laughs> I love it. Survivor love of it. teenagers. Survivor of teenagers. How about that? <laughs> Oh my God, I do, I do, I dig a little bit, Stevens. I'm going to stay with Gavin for a little bit just to kind of just uh, talk to him about some things that I found in on the World Wide Web, as we call the internet. Uh, so the last time, I, again, I love how almost in every interview or any kind of um, news article that I see about you is that everybody says um, that you grew up in the north of London, which I find that kind of interesting that people find that still funny, and I do too. Is that? Is that just a thing? Is that something like, tell me about north, that. Like, You mean North yeah. N-O-R-F? North. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, it's not I, funny if you live there. It's just how it is. But I think, you know, you know, you know what? It's not funny. Have you heard Americans speak? Have you heard, have you heard <laughs> it's not funny at all. You know, it's like, I was always trying to kind of like give an example of what it's, what New York and in London is because there's a you know there's the boroughs in the, in in uh, in New York and there's also boroughs in in London. So I'm kind of from the Bronx. Ah, oh, Kevin, now that's that, that, North Kevin, London. Is that the um? Is that like the Peaky Blinders area? No, the Peaky Blinders is is the Midlands. That's Midlands. Birmingham. Birmingham. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> So, that's so like, we all know that's Phoebe, like, yeah. Phoebe uh, is in London right now. Uh, okay. Where are so you, Phoebe? I'm, in, I'm actually in North London, so I'm in Wood Green. Oh, really? Well, I'm for, I, I grew up in Wembley and then lived in Queen's Park. Oh, uh, okay, a bit more western. So, yeah, so Wood Green is you know, <clears throat> it's great for like, I remember Greek food and Cypriot food and yeah. Yeah, they've still got, there's a, there's a road opposite me with the best kind of bakeries, Greek food job. And the only place I think I've seen Greek wine out of Greece, because I didn't realize when I went there, I was like, I never see Greek wine. Gretzina, Gretzina wine. Is it Grappa or Gretzina? Gretzina is the one that smells of cork. Yes, ooh, ooh. It's disgusting. But they called it Wood Greek when I was living in London, Wood Greek. (laughs) Yeah, do you know what? It It is still very Greek, I'd say. Um, but yeah, it's. I don't know, how long ago were you last here? I I moved to America in two thousand and five. Oh, okay, see, so, yeah. I lived I lived all my life in in London. You look, you sound London. like you're a Londoner though. I'm oh, actually, she's definitely she's definitely a Londoner. Oh yeah, yes. Well, I'm actually Essex, so but I managed to get away with it sounding as London now. <laughs> yeah, all my cousins are from Ilford and Chigwell. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Stephen, Essex, it's like Essex a totally like, like Japanese, right? Like, I don't know what the hell they're saying. No, Chigwell, Essex. So that's where the Cockney sounds, a lot of Cockney, because that's more, more East. But chest, it's like um, in, in New York, we call it Bridge and Tunnel, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Jersey, it's, that's yeah. what it's like if you're coming in from uh, New Jersey. I right? see. I love it. I love it. Well, I mean, not only did you grow up in London and have all these fabulous like uh, stories as most Londoners do about where they live, you're mm-hmm. also, uh, you know, you, your parents were an actor and an artist. And yeah. uh, 
And you collect, again, last time I saw some fabulous art. Do you have any new art to show in the past year or so? Is there something that that is like the most recent art that you collect? Oh, you my have- God, yeah. I'm in my office. Um, no, you know what? It's all being, I'm in a new space now. So oh. uh, um, there's, oh, this piece here. This is new. Oh. You see this? These yeah. are weighing scales stacked on each other like a spine. What are they? They're weighing scales. No, that's crazy. Yeah. Who, who's the artist? That's that's insane. Like I mean, that's Gavin Lester. That's Gav, That's me. There you go. <laughs> I, so he's not I, like. I, I be, well, uh, acquisitions. Oh, I made a good acquisition. I, I put, yeah, one, here's one. Here's a good one. Also, Gav, did you ever do the stroller? Huh? Did you do the stroller? No, that's being made. This is a Paul McCarthy. <laughs> no, it is not. <laughs> no, no it Paul is McCarthy. Not. Paul McCarthy. <laughs> Paul McCarthy. The artist. That's I a good one. Wow. <clears throat> I love it. I love that your your family, like at an early age, because you mean, look, you have an actor and an artist. It's hard to like get away from creativity. Yeah. right? And we're born creative. And then somehow our peers yeah. beat us out of it and make us do ba- baseball and football and all that other shit. But yeah. um, the fact that you like have such a profound you know, love of art, it's just so amazing. And how does that does that like so- somehow weave its way into your creativity and how does that happen if it does uh well you know it's interesting i mean i think you know anyone in this creative field is creative but i think we're trained we train ourselves slightly differently in advertising because we're we're work we're making work on behalf of other people you know we're 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 making it you know on behalf of our clients to a demographic or an audience that isn't necessarily us right so it's it's a slightly different approach to creativity it's more like acting you know um where yeah. and there's an art to that without a doubt but but it's not autobiographical i think i think you know i think art i think creatives who somehow manage to make work that is an expression of themselves i don't think they last that long in this industry because it's you know because it, i mean i remember you know i always wanted to get like a, a, an octopus in an ad or a unicorn in an ad you know or, you know and <laughs> It, 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 you can't do it when you're talking about frozen peas on the tabletop, you know, it's not going to work. So you just got to kind of, um, you, you have to divorce yourself a little bit from the thing, but it's, it, so does it work, find its way in? I think taste. Yeah. Is yeah. There, but I don't know if it really does. I, I do think that I got to keep those two things separately. Yeah. It's interesting. I love that. Well, Welcome. We're glad to have you. I'm going to go Thank to you. our second guest, Mr. Stephen Goldblatt. And I, I, you're the founder and partner of uh, Partners in Crime LLC in San Francisco, California. Correct. Mill Valley, but it was San Francisco. But yeah, it's it's a uh, it's migrated over the bridge. I'm a bridge and tunnel guy now. Yeah, you are. Oh my God, I hardly Jersey. Uh, you could refer to as uh, in Mill Valley, but that's okay. I get it. Uh, tell me, so like, I do love. I hear that your nickname might be Goldie. Do people call you that? Correct. It's um, yeah, officially. I'm a third generation Goldie from my dad to my brother to me. Really? Yeah. How did your dad get that um that nickname? A Goldblatt. It just sort of comes with the territory. I think um, you know, he was Goldie not through his life, but at, at a certain point in his in his life. And my brother was in college, and <clears throat> I'm not sure exactly when it hit hit for me, but it was um, it's probably I'm guessing at the in the in the Goodby days or or early uh, you know, in, uh, in that in that point of my career. I, you know, everyone had 11 nicknames and this one just kind of stuck. We had a tight crew at Goodby, so it was just sort of, we had a shorthand with everybody. It was a tight crew at Goodby. There's, there's a, it's a, it's a legacy place. Like it's, you just know the people that came from Goodby. It's kind of interesting. Um, Gavin, do you have a nickname by any chance? Uh, I, I'm Shrek, you know, that's Answer. what I was known as. <laughs> yeah. Well, well I, I worked at Goodby with, with Steve. I don't think I was known as Shrek at Goodby. No. Ah. Yeah. You were just handsome. Yeah, but you were handsome and you were uh, handsome. Handsome Gavin. I love but, it. But a BBH London, they, I would walk around. They used to call me the wandering Jew as well, because I'd like to walk around a lot. But getting back to you, like, is yeah. Negroni like one of your favorite drinks or something? I have a lot of favorite drinks, but that's on the top of the list. Um, yeah. And I like to modify them. I like. Um, oh, tradi- right. So a traditional Negroni is great. Nothing wrong with that. Um, but then you can start replacing Campari with Aperol. Yes. Ooh, that's which good. Is great. Or you can mix it. Um, Ooh. Or you can or you can replace the um the uh the vermouth with like Lillet. 
Ah, very and nice. Get, and then and then that with Aperol gets very light. Or you can replace the gin with whiskey. Ooh, I never thought about that, but that would be isn't that a Manhattan? <laughs> I mean, it's, a, like... it's called a it's called a it's the most pretentious name for a cocktail, I believe. It's called the Boulevardier. <laughs> that is very pretentious. Very, it very pretentious. But it's um it's amazing. And so anyway, I like the Negroni for sure. I think it's a it's a great drink. Yeah, you have you have a lot of on your Instagram. So tell me, um, there was um your first Instagram was um April, I think like uh 2012. And it was four kids on a on a step. Do you remember that? Four kids on the steps. It was your literally your first like Instagram ever. How funny. Um anyway, I, I, I have two yeah. I'll go, I'll go on. I'll go on. It's just I always like go to people's like first uh their first Instagrams always. Um Gavin well, has Well, I would say that my kids are at the, you know, they're they're they've been my sort of test pilots for since the beginning of social media and a lot of this. So um I wouldn't be surprised. That would probably them. Probably them. <laughs> I love that. Um tell me, I know you were a prankster. Um so tell me about the the Twinsburg uh twin fest. <sighs> Uh, that's a funny story. I can't believe you found that one. That's, um, <clears throat> I was doing a shoot. I was doing a shoot with, um, a photographer named Stuart Cohen. Mm. He's based in Dallas and I lived in Dallas at the time. And I think we were shooting with John Elway in mm. Denver. And, um, so we did a shoot with John Elway and then he said, what are you, um, he said, what are you doing now? And I, at the time I was, it was my first job in the industry and, um, I had no plan. So I was like, nothing. He's like, why don't you come to Twinsburg, Ohio with me? I'm going to photograph a Twins Fest, which is what Mary Ellen Mark shot. And um, there have been a lot of photographers through that festival. And what it is, it's it's the largest um, uh, convention for identical twins. So it's just kind of a mind fuck. When you go there, you're like, you see the most unique individual and then you see the same thing twice. You see the same person with the ice cream dripping on their hands the same way and the shorts riding up their legs the same way. And it's just, it's insane. So my job for, cause Stuart was making a book and he had work to do and I didn't. So what I would do is um, he gave me a walkie and I would just sort of walkie in when I found interesting folks. <laughs> like, um, now did you, but did you also like go around and go, have you seen my twin? Yeah, I, my brother. I would ask people if they'd see my oh, brother. Have you seen my brother? Yeah, and you don't yeah. have a twin. Yeah, and it got some people worked up, but most people got the joke, and it was it was pretty funny. But that that was a fun that was a fun weekend, and I, I you know it was back when I had literally nothing on my agenda, so I could take the time and go do interesting conventions like that. I love it. That's great. Uh, I, I'm just going to ask about two more things. One is um, we'll get to the Creative Growth uh, Art Center in Oakland in a second, but. I saw something on Instagram. It's like 2017. It was the belt champion belt buckle from KMMA. <clears throat> 2017 was that a rodeo? Like, was that? Did you just see somebody's like belt buckle and take that photo? Oh yeah, <clears throat> that was oh, actually was that shot. That no, that was um. Uh, my in-laws have a place in in um outside of uh, um, Eagle in Colorado. Ah yeah yeah yeah. And they always have a rodeo. They have a rodeo there um, annually or. I don't even monthly, I have no idea. But when we were there one time, we went to the rodeo and um yeah, and I just started taking pictures and I and I saw these kids um showing their cows and their chickens and um taking a lot of pride in what they had raised. And um so I started taking pictures of their belt buckle, which is the trophy that they get when they win um uh, first prize in one of these shows. And it was just interesting to me to see the shirt match with the jeans, match with you know, and just it yeah. was just sort of a fun series that you could knock off in four minutes because there were so many belt buckles. But that was that's the whole story there. It was just I was just taking a lot of pictures at this uh, at the rodeo. Well, I love it. I, I thought it was I thought it was amazing. It obviously caught my 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 attention as well. But talk to us about the uh, the Creative uh, Growth Art Center in Oakland really quickly. Are you still associated and affiliated? I would assume. That yeah, I'm a collector. I'm trying to think. Yeah. I have, I probably have a lot around here. Um, so. I mean, it kind of starts in the, in, when, I, when, I, when I was in Texas, I used to collect um, like black Southern folk art. Um, and I used to call it like work that was created out of necessity. Like they didn't really create the work to uh, achieve an audience or to make money or to get into galleries or do anything. It was just sort of, they woke up in the morning and it spoke to them and they created art. And that's what I love in artwork in general. So when I moved to San Francisco, a friend of mine introduced me to 
<clears throat> creative growth. Creative growth was founded, I'll make this quick, I promise, but creative growth was founded by the Katz family in the, I believe in the 70s, when um, the, um, the Disability Act came into, came into action. So that, so all of the institutions and places that held <clears throat> people who lived outside the norm went away and, 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 and there was a, a, um, a growth of, of organizations that um, would help facilitate families that had um, uh, relatives that needed support, right? So the CATS has created three organizations, Creative Growth in Oakland, NIAD <clears throat> in the Richmond, and then um, Creativity Explored in, in San Francisco. Mm. Adult Artists with Disabilities, and it's um, half studio, half gallery. So they market the artists and their artwork and, um, and the money that is that they make through selling the artwork goes back to the artist, to this, to the, uh, to the person themselves. So the, the great thing about, so I, I, I was introduced to the organization in the late nineties and my wife and I have just been collecting artwork since, um, and I was a board member for eight years. And, wow. uh, so the great thing about the organization, if you look at them now, and there was actually an exhibit at the um, at Studio Voltaire in London recently, um, and one of my pieces was in the show, um, and that, and then it went to Sweden to be in another show there. So what's happened is, uh, outsider art, <clears throat> traditional art, it's it's officially met and and merged. It's where 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 outsider art and visionary artists are now included in uh, the Biennale in Venice and major wow. retrospectives and major exhibits around the world. So the, the market for these artists, they're collected by Cause and Cindy Sherman and a lot of amazing artists collect creative growth artwork. So it's just been amazing to be part of that journey and to see their um, star rise over the past 20 years. Wow, well, bravo, that's, that's extraordinary. Um, particularly when you see the transition from like, you know, I mean, it's not like San Francisco and you know, those are big, big markets, but the transition to, you know, international um, spotlight in the art world is really big. Uh, congratulations. That's amazing. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's really cool. And um, yeah, it's a, it's an amazing organization and um, I'm not on the board anymore, but I, I continue to uh, support and introduce yeah. folks to it. Well, hopefully uh, so some of our audience, if not all of them will uh, now know about if they don't already um, this great organization. So, well, let's get on to the first question. So the first question is that you're having a dinner party and you can bring back anybody from the dead, four people, let's just say four people from the dead, or they don't even have to be from dead, just four people uh, at this dinner party. Who would they be and why would you bring them back and why would you invite them to this dinner? Gavin, what about you? Um, first person would be Voltaire, right? Who wrote oh. Candide. Okay, yep. obviously yep. A, a, a kind of a, a very great cynic and, um, you know, political satirist, you know, and I think the clim current climate would be great platform for him right now. A great and the music and the music fits the, the climate as well. You know, that yeah. whole opening to that whole uh, Gendi, the overture is amazing. Yeah, that's right. So I, I would, I would, he would be there. I would then bring in, um, here, yeah, Sid Vicious. <laughs> Brilliant. Because I think we need a bit of that anarchy. And then I want to balance that out with Mother Teresa. Wow. But I think that would be a good old mix. Now, this one I'm doing for, I'm going to do, I don't think everyone would appreciate this one, but I would bring back Claude Shade as well. Oh. Uh -huh. so Claude used to work with us at, at Goodby. Good and call. He, was, he, he was our, he was like, he was a creative, he was a photographer, he ran the studio. And he was the most enigmatic guy you'd ever met, the most optimistic guy you'd ever met. And he was he was almost like the linchpin of that agency, wasn't he? He was kind of 100%. like- 100%. And, and he was, you look at him and you think he's, I don't know, think of a number and then add 20 years and that's what he actually was. Like he just played so much younger and he was the most alive person in that office. And he he passed away, unfortunately, um, a while ago. And, and uh, now he's remembered well. I mean, there's a lot of great mm. stories that continue to fly around about Claude. He was the best. Was he? Was he at Goodby early on? He was on for. I, well, I was at Goodby 2005, 2007, right? And he was there. And he'd been there for a while before that. Like, he was a fixture. So he'd been there. I, I think he'd been there 15 years, maybe. Yeah, yeah, he ran the he ran the dark room, and I was honored by getting a. I had a key to the dark room, and no one else had a key to the dark room. 
Um, <clears throat> but he was just like a, and he knew everybody and he was, he was German yeah. and he worked with some amazing photographers and he was just a great, he had a great memory and he was a great storyteller. Um, and he was, he was just a big partier and he loved to hang out and he loved to laugh. And smoke a lot of weed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that really what he would do with, amongst these guys though, he would, he would be a very natural, natural participant in this, in this, in this narrative. <laughs> he would thread it all together. He would ask questions. He would get it. Going oh yeah. Stuff. He would keep up with so, some dishes. Who would you sit next to? Who at this table? Like who is sitting next to Sid? Oh, you know, Mother <laughs> Teresa sitting next to Sid Vicious. Absolutely, you know? without a <laughs> doubt. Oh my God. <laughs> Look, I mean, I think you know. Imagine Mother Teresa talking to Sid Vicious and Voltaire, like you know, in his you know, uh, his mind, like what that would be. I don't, I don't know Shaw, but if he's one of those guys who weaves in. You know, people, it makes them feel like uh, they're a part of the conversation. That is a crazy dinner. Yeah. I mean, well, so I would, you know, you're looking for some friction and tension points, yeah. right? Isn't that what yeah. we're looking for? Um, uh, thank you for that. That's a pretty amazing. I'd love to be a fly on the wall at that dinner. What about you, uh, uh, Goldie? So I made a list here. I was thinking, I think King Tut, I've been very into like Egyptology later. And I think bringing back the king, the, the boy king, and finding out, did he fall off a, a chariot? Like what, you know? What really how, happened? Yeah. How did it transpire? And um, and why did they build build your tomb so quickly? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I I put him on the list. I think uh, Vincent Van Gogh has always been a fascinating yeah. character for me. Um, how he lost his mind and moved to Oral, and um, why he moved to Oral, and you know, why he had no friends and that kind of thing. I think, he, I just think he's a, and I love his artwork. He's one of my favorite artists. Um, so I, I put him at the table with King Tut. Um, mm. I'd round it off with a little Amelia Earhart. Oh, very interesting. Wow. Um, to, you know, again, like mystery, solving some mysteries, like what, mm. what ultimately happened. <clears throat> um, and I think she'd be a great voice of today. And I think she would, uh, I think she'd be, she, her, her perspective would be welcomed. And then, um, and then I think just to to moderate and to to keep things going, I I put Anthony Bourdain at the table. Oh wow, that's crazy! That's you know, to insane. ask questions about spices and what King Tut was eating and those kinds of things. <laughs> that's amazing. We don't uh, Anthony Bourdain would probably love that. Uh, yeah, I look. I think that they're, they're both really great uh, dinner uh, guest list. Wow. Uh, well, with that, um, that's brilliant. Uh, question number two. So. You know, what was the most difficult decision that you've made in the last two years? And how did you come to that decision? The, the, the most difficult of all decisions in the past two years. And, you know, look, we know that we've been in lockdown, um, you know, in work. Uh, you you know, you've had to probably make some really hard decisions and probably in your personal life as well, being in quarantine with your family. But um, anyway, I'm going to go with you, Gavin, again. I think I'm getting older, I think, is is all, almost about um not not necessarily letting go but kind of admitting to yourself that that there is some new ways of looking at things or fresh ways of looking at things or you know even though they may behave or do the same thing ultimately i'm not at the control of those things anymore and mm. having to let go I think this has happened many times in my life is that kind of a, that that acknowledgement of like I wouldn't have done it that way but it came out well or you know and I think it's good to see you know um the 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 the, the whatever's coming is in good hands you know seeing that they're in good hands and and giving it over to the younger people sometimes is is hard <laughs> but I think the kids are all right I think they're doing somewhat of a good job so I think that's been probably the toughest thing and that's like again the things of even from a personal I've seen my kids you know that, that there's a right of passage that you have to kind of stand back from and not micromanage so if, if it's the hardest thing in the last two years or just something that consistently rears its head once in a while and I have to kind of acknowledge it I think that's maybe the thing yeah look I think uh I think it's amazing because I do think I don't know, like, I think difficult decisions um, happen throughout your life, I hope, uh, you know, and I hope um, we all learn from those, which it sounds like that you did. And, you know, being in lockdown really presented a different type of kind of decision making process in both mm -hmm. work from Zoom and not being with people and 
be in with your family who you're not necessarily um, always, uh, you know, 24 seven with. So I think. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I can talk about, I think one of the questions is about what I learned from COVID, but, but I, I did come to work every day for two years. I came to the office. I didn't, I didn't break step. Oh, I, didn't, I, I didn't try yeah. to, I didn't try to kind of, um, I mean, I had to acknowledge the fact that our lives were in Zoom, you know, but, um, but <laughs> yes. I tried to kind of keep the same kind of um, processes in place, you know, go, getting up in the morning, going to an office, you know, sitting in front of, and then breaking that point and going home. I think our Zoom well, you know, that, that you know, you remember Superman 2, the original Superman 2 with Christopher Reeves and the, yep. the uh, Zod, whatever, you know, when they got imprisoned in the, in the uh, glass. Crystal? Yep, yeah. yep. Remember that? And they kind of sent through the galaxy, you know? Yeah, I think that's what our lives. Is. If there's any image that represents our life on Zoom, it's kind of that. Those three, you know, prisoners in that. <laughs> that's crazy. I think you're maybe the first person that I've I've talked to or that has acknowledged that they literally did not change the trajectory of you know their lives during the pandemic and the way that they, you know, woke up and existed in the workplace or in your life. That's amazing. Um, uh, what about you, Stephen? What's like uh, the most difficult decision for you, and why did you make it? I think it 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 for me it has to come down to the idea of the idea of time and and <clears throat> what we what we choose to spend our time on. Um, so I think those decisions they continue to happen. I mean, it it ranges from when a piece of business comes in, do you take it? Do you really want to spend your time doing it? <laughs> so half your brain is like, yes, you need the revenue. Yes, you need to do the work. Yes, we need to keep people busy. And, um, and on the other side, it's like, but it's, is it going to help move me and the company forward? Um, so there's always that balancing act. And because I, I do feel like there's just, you know, there's instability in the industry, there's instability in what we do for the past two or three years. So I think there's, there's been some big decisions that I've made, where I've, gotten myself underwater with too much work or I've taken something on that wasn't as gratifying or, or, or profitable as I thought. Um, and then I also, conversely, I think that I've, I've been able to commit um, wholeheartedly into certain things, you know, like put all of myself into total commitments that I probably wasn't able to or willing to three years ago. Uh -huh. You know, so, so, you know, with partners in crime, like I'm, I'm investing heavily into it now and I've been doing it, but it's like, as opposed to seeing where it was going to go or what was going to happen to it, I feel like I'm driving its destiny more so than I was able to three years ago. And I think that's a commitment that I've allowed myself to make knowing that, you know, time is a, is a, it's a, it's a factor that you can, you can control if you, do, if you want to, you can, you can decide to, uh, you know, make the most of it. Or you could you could wear pajamas all day and you know complain about what how our industry is fucked up these days and what's happening. Wow, I actually think that's interesting. See, I was looking at the peloton you've got behind you as well, and I always think I'm never making enough time to get on mine, and I always have an excuse <laughs> to not go on it. But it's things like that where it's like you you sometimes can tell yourself that you don't have the control over the time, and I think actually it's just pushing yourself to say that you do and reshuffling it right. Even with yeah, work. I agree. Yeah, and I think I th I just think managing your time. Not that I'm a, I'm I'm regimented, but um, I'm probably like Gavin, where you give yourself, you know, I give myself too many projects, and um, it's it's kind of a fun game to play to see uh, how many you can actually do, as opposed to just put on the list of things to do. So yeah, wow, being, being productive. Being productive. I mean, I think that's great. I mean, I think, look, I think that's what um, the pandemic was about. I think, you know, in a weird way early on, you know, um, I, I said this a lot and maybe too much, but, you know, in production and maybe in advertising, you know, the the people used to make a statement, they would go, well, we're not creating, we're not, we're, you know, we're not curing cancer. We're not like, but yet in the pandemic, you guys creatively did a lot. Yeah. You did help cure people and help people and bring people through a time that was um unprecedented in 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 our lifetime and 
And I think that um, it would not have happened if you didn't have the time or you didn't get up every morning, uh, Gavin, and do what you did, um, which what, what I was saying that blew my mind is like, what was that drive like every day to the office? Like, did you see, you know, did the, were the freeways packed? Were, you know, did you, were you greeted by anybody? Did you see anybody? Like, it just, I don't know. Um, my, my, my kind of metaphor for what it was, I felt like I, I may have mentioned this before in some other article, but it was like, I was traveling through kind of galaxies in a, on a kind of a mining, on a mining ship. And I was placed in like suspended animation hibernation and then I got woken up early uh, and it was just me and my dog walking around this giant you know this giant spaceship going about our day you know um but I do think the reason why is is when you look at history and even though it was a, a very impactful time you know to our a disrupted time to our lives COVID it's only a small amount of time <laughs> Mm. And between the you know the beginning of time and now, we've seen people land on the moon. We've seen the the kind of the pyramids been built. We've seen all these great achievements. So, does that mean it's going to stop? Why should it stop? Why should mm. it ever? Stop? So, I think that Protestant work ethic is really important. Yeah, you know, even as a Jew, it's a Protestant work ethic I apply. It's so, <laughs> Pick up on that. Yeah, I figured Stephen would uh, pick up on that. But you know, you know, again, uh, conversely, you know, Stephen, like what you were saying is that you know, making you know decisions about taking on jobs uh, are too many, or uh, uh, during a pandemic where you had no vision of what tomorrow is going to bring, or next month, or next year, or whatever. Um, that must have been very impactful in a way that, um, you know, like you said, you're you're able to see the fruits of this great uh, decision making process that you um, the journey you were on for like three years, two years, whatever. Yeah, and I, and one, one thing that I that was interesting is that <clears throat> you're making these decisions. I've got this board here with projects and people and things, and um, I didn't have the I didn't have insight into the other the rest of the industry, how other agencies were doing or how other people were doing, and. I really sort of kept my head down and I was just doing things. And when I looked up, I saw that I saw a lot of great work and a lot of agencies were doing great. And some were actually closing and closing their offices. And it was just interesting. It was, it was, yeah, it was kind of a big lesson in, yeah. Like what realizing what, um, what you're capable of doing and, and if you can, you know, if, if Gavin's, uh, M you know, M MO is to, get up, go to the office. And that's his, that's his world in which to operate his, uh, you know, his world from, I think, I think that's crucial to know where you need to be and what you need to be doing to, yeah, yeah. to get things done, to, to feel like you're, um, well, Henry Matisse would go to the, the studio from nine to five. He treated it very much like a job. Uh, and yeah. if you look at artists as well, it's like if you think about success as an artist, like if you think about a period, sorry, a life life cycle of an artist, they may have kind of very kind of like uh, spiked moments in their careers where they really become established. But after that, they don't, right? I mean, you know, someone like Picasso had multiple different spikes, but on the whole, most artists have one spike. Yeah. But does that mean once they've spiked, they are no longer creating, you know? We're not, you know, I think the th thing is, is that we need to consistently do do something. We need to be pushing something forward always, right? And I think what COVID did, in a bad way, I think it gave a lot of people who may not be energized or, or prolific at things or, or, um, or um, competitive to take it easy. I would say that sounds, that sounds pretty ruthless, but I think it does give, it has given people an easy way out. To a certain degree yeah but why should why should creativity or why should anything stop you like you know we had to work with our clients who were suffering from you know you know this this situation we had to find creative solutions to their problems you know I yeah remember doing something for Traeger we had a we had Traeger as one of our clients as a wood pellet grill and they were you know they were like trying to find some communication for um you know, for their products. And and one of the headlines, one of the out-home boards was, you don't have to go out for dinner, you just have to go outside, all right? 
<laughs> and 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 you know what that did was that that you know you were looking at the kind of the ingredients of what was available in in culture in in convers in the conversation and you're using that to find creative solutions so there's a lot of great things that came out of covid there's a lot of new dialogue right yeah Not to be oh everything's just stopping nothing stops yeah yeah i mean i don't you, don't you think i mean and we'll go on from this but don't you think that you know it's that old saying like you know things happen the way they happen for the right reason when they happen but the truth is is like you know when you stop you know look i think there are a lot of people that did use this as a, an excuse to like go and you know do personal things or whatever that was i think when the majority of the people really needed to to stop i i was one of those people i literally made like you guys made you know hundreds and maybe a lot of decisions every day without even thinking about them not thinking about what the repercussions of the decision was or who I was speaking to, or just like, I just made them because that was what happened. And then the pandemic happens and you have to stop. You, you literally could not do anything. So I think the, just the mere fact that it gave us an opportunity to stop for a second yeah. and just kind of be, uh, whether you were in fear or you were inspired or you were all those things, uh, it allowed us to make those right decisions that fit each one of our lives. Do you remember? Yeah. Do you remember the early? Do you remember early on in pandemic where we would have conversations about maybe it's another month, maybe it's another two oh, months, yeah. <laughs> as, as if there was a place to go back to. Yes. And somewhere along the way, I, maybe it was year one where it was just like, you know what? I'm 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 going to stop thinking about an endpoint. And I'm going to forget about where I came from. I mean, it's it's a little crazy to think about. It's a little sci-fi that the reality that we came from isn't there anymore. And it's not even around the corner. It's not no, no, to no. be had. Well, we also, I mean, again, like, look, I, I'm, I guess I'm in a fortunate seat as well as, as a CCO and a part of a company. And also, you know, so I, I felt the need to keep going. I, I do think that COVID did give, when you're right, with the pause, it gave people an opportunity to reflect and have a moment of autonomy where people don't always have autonomy. And we saw people, you know, and I think maybe there was an overcorrection there because people would, would you remember trying to hire people during COVID and how oh. everybody was, everybody wanted it their way and everybody was incredibly expensive and and I think that was a negative, I believe, that came out of COVID, that people were um, abusing the kind of that moment, that right that they had, you know? And now I think there's unfortunately going to be this complete correction, you know, where we're seeing thousands of people losing their jobs in the workplace. We're seeing companies now demanding people to come back to the, to the, the workplace like Disney. And that's only going to have a trickle-down effect where yeah. truly, I, I believe, any great creative agency would have a hybrid model because when you're working and collaborating, you have to be together. But when you're writing and art directing, you can be wherever you are, right? It doesn't matter. That's always been the case in my mind, right? But now I think there's going to be this huge correction that I, you know, I foresee, you know? Yeah. Amazing. Um, thank you guys for indulging. Um, I'm going to let Phoebe do the next one. And yeah, just um, speaking a little bit uh, as we did about time and, and, and I guess taking a pause, when you do um, actually make some kind of precious time for yourself and, and take a moment to kind of unwind from, from work or, or within the workday, um, where, do you, where do you guys go to? Um, maybe start with Stephen. Yeah, my, uh, my sort of safe space or my creative space um, is uh, used bookstores. I'm a big... Uh, I'm a I'm a, a, a photography book uh, junkie. Um, <laughs> they, they actually so exist. What's that? Do they actually still exist? They what? Use bookstores. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, they exist. And you know, I think um, it's funny. It okay, it's a good question because they used to there used to be a lot of them, and their their in, their inventory would turn over quite a bit. Uh, but now I've. Um, there's, you know, whether it's eBay or Amazon or just like this, I, I, I like the searching and I like the scouring and I like the, um, you know, turning over a leaf and finding something. So wherever that needs to happen, I think that's where that's where I go. Um, actually, I just found this book that is pretty interesting. The Bible. <laughs> you say? The Torah. The Torah, yeah. No, it's called um, it's called Born into a Felony. Oh wow! 
and yeah, and it's uh, by this guy named Walt Shepard, and it's poetry and photographs and um, uh, the penitentiary from from the incarcerated, and it was done in 1973. And I just do I do research on these books, and I post them on an Instagram account called Photo Book Finds, and it's ah. just and I've I've got a great community, and it's just like a great place to uh, I love it. It's it's very creative, and it's it's a uh, it's kind of like treasure hunting. So for me, it's it's garage sales and flea markets and used bookstores and like where you walk in and you have like eight things in your mind that you're looking for, but you end up finding two other things that you had no idea that you'd yeah. come across. That's where, that's where I, that's where I go and, and um, think about nothing else. And it really is uh, sort of liberating in that sense. You find as well with, I mean, with, especially with photography books, so I, I find there's so much content on the internet that when you, you know, you could go looking for prison photography, right? But it's never, um, unless you've got a special person on Instagram or something like that, yeah. like curated into a little collection that you can look through. Do you find you like to have things that are kind of put together like that? Because I, sometimes I, when I'm looking for inspirational art or something, I'm like, I feel like I just get lost in this mass of stuff. But it seems like to me that I, the reason I would like books is that going back, you can really dig into just something that's been curated for you, I guess. Yeah, and I think the, for books, books for me are interesting because there's the, there's the, usually there's the photography, <clears throat> that's one story. There's the publisher, that's another story. There's the time when it was published, like the, the, the conditions that were happening in the world that made this book interesting at the time. The number of books that, that were made, if it's signed, if it's inscribed to somebody, the condition of it and the, the life it's lived. Um, and then I think when you bring it home and you put it on their shelf and it's curated amongst others, that tells a completely different story because as you know, your collection is ultimately way different than anybody else's. So I just love them. I think they're little artifacts and it allows me to, to uh, participate in, in photography and artwork in a way that isn't overwhelming, even though it's overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> I can yeah. I can I yeah. can organize these and put them away and it's not you know it's it's not um it's not getting in the way as much as uh framing photography or putting things up or spending thousands on a on a print would be it's a it's a book and it and it's its own little thing. I was thinking as well do you have a coffee table that you've never seen the bottom of because there's a lot of these books on? <laughs> well, I have I mean I have a lot of these you know, <laughs> yes, I have a lot of credenzas and bookshelves around the house full of uh, full of books, but they're great. And I and I, you know, the quick story about how I got into it was, you know, when I was a, a good art director, you know, and you'd buy you'd go to Hennessy and Ingle in, in L.A. and you'd come home with a stack of books. And, you know, typically you'd, you'd, you'd learn about the book or you wouldn't and it would still go on your shelf. And I remember I had this moment where I looked at my bookshelf and I didn't know any of the books. They were big and expensive, but I didn't really know them. And. I, I, I committed to giving myself a, a dollar amount limit. I'm going to give myself ten dollars. I'm going to go to a used bookstore. I'm going to find something that's meaningful. So I'd find myself going through these books, and I'm like, oh my god, that's actually fascinating. I'd bring it home, and that meant more to me than a two hundred dollar book that I that was told to buy by somebody at the bookstore. Yeah. So I did that for. I've been doing it for six, seven years, and I've, I've, I've. You know, I've I've come across amazing photographers and amazing publishers and uh, so many amazing little little stories that I never would have found if I didn't give myself the time to find them. So that's sort of that's my collection. That's what I love doing. Or I find interesting publishers in Texas and I I, I celebrate them and bring them to to the light. So that's sort of that's what I love doing. Amazing, yeah, that's amazing. so interesting. And yet, like you say, it's almost like having that kind of limit on what you're looking for has made you find even better and more interesting, amazing things, which is, is awesome. Yeah. Um, and how about you, Gavin? It's not too dissimilar in the sense that I like to go walk around, you know, I go, especially when I'm traveling, I, I make sure that I get to walk around that, that city and take in the culture and try the local food and just really kind of like immerse myself in those things, which is, it, I don't think it's any just a sense of coming across a book and, and kind of like uh, falling into that. Um, you know, wherever it is, you know, we opened up an office in Minneapolis and I had never been to Minneapolis and I went there and I kind of remember just walking 
but eight hours around that whole city and just kind of by the end of it like being pretty local with it so um but that could be anywhere anywhere in the world um, yeah. got some trips coming up soon actually i'm gonna talk about but they're, they're pretty phenomenal <laughs> oh. so gonna be um doing a lot of that there so and it's it's actually you know we you know being like walking into art galleries is really interesting because like you always I always find myself let down when I walk into an art gallery you know there's, there's you know you're very lucky I think maybe because I'm looking to what to see something to inspire me and and very little aspire, inspires to be honest um, but when you walk outside and you you come into kind of contact with you know a new restaurant or an, or or a vantage point you've never seen before or an object. I think it's a lot more powerful. So those things are really, um, I will say, inspiring. I'm looking, you know, I'm, I think I'm have looking you, for. Um, Gav, have something. you read? Um, have you started Rick Rubin's new book by chance? Oh. <laughs> yeah, I got mine. I got mine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so funny. Yeah. Chris, Chris, yeah. Chris Rybot put this for me. It's amazing. Is, yeah, it's very good. But but yeah. the idea, the idea about keeping yourself open, you know, yeah. living the life of an artist and being receptive to it. I think he says in there, um, uh, sometimes the artist isn't the one who made the art, it's the one who acknowledged it as being art. Yeah, I, I believe in a lot of this, and I haven't read this book yet, I did hear a slight po podcast that was sent to me on him, but um, you know, it's, I think things are out there in the atmosphere. I think, I think whatever's happening in the world creates some kind of vibration or conversation or something that that the, the most sensitive types of people who traditionally are creative people are able to gravitate towards right and i think they can then translate that into some kind of be it a piece of art or a piece of conversation or something like that so and it's allowing yourself to be that conduit isn't it that right. uh, allows things to come through so i think you know you going out looking for, for books or me walking around looking just for things whatever it may be or experiences is allowing myself to just be this open cable, you know, where things can pass through. Yeah. You know? And the things where, you know, there are things that get caught up on that internal cable that are, I respond to probably more than others, right? And that those become things. And also he, he mentioned something about um when 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 the idea is ready for prime time or when you know sometimes yeah. you come up with an idea that isn't quite it doesn't it doesn't um gain traction or it doesn't right it doesn't cause the um the, re the reaction but but later on it gets recognized or something happens like the idea is allowed to live out there without being recognized it just needs to be plucked and presented at the right time yeah i totally agree with that i and i talk to creatives like that that's a nice way of letting creatives down when they've got an idea that isn't yeah. <laughs> it's like it's like you say like you've got an idea there but it's just not the right time it's not you know, it's not happening at the you right just gave time. away your it's true, really it's like i know it's that's just, i think you think that. about artwork you think about artwork and you think about um how if you were to look at david's david's um michelangelo's david for instance and you look at it back in the day it was presented as a an adonis like you know yeah. character. now today if you look at it through a different vantage point of maybe kind of more of a through diverse eyes it, it could be seen as vanity or it could be seen as um or it could be seen as a um maybe homosexual you know it could be seen as lots of different things because the, the the time we're looking at things through so very much agree with you there and i think Rick ruben is and i what well, i and i haven't read this book i've only heard the podcast but I, it's not about his experiences in studios or working with also artists and no he doesn't mention much about the creative process yeah he, apparently i haven't he doesn't mention any artist by name. He mentions he talks he talks through stories, but he never yeah. calls them out uh, so that they're not distracting to you know to the, uh, the yeah. point. I think as the creative person, I think it would be. I think this this book is going to be very much like a um, uh, uh, a uh, an approval of our process. I don't think it's going to be enlightening. I think it's just going to be a a oh okay, someone gets it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. right. And you know, there's some science behind the um the walking part as well in terms of I think I'm pretty sure some countries now prescribe walking and nature and getting outside of your normal yeah. environment. Yeah. 
as like a therapy. So <laughs> sounds a, and a bit of mm. both mixed in. Um, amazing. And then Oliver. Yes, absolutely. Well, um, so the fourth question is: the pandemic has changed a lot about our personal lives, for better or for worse. How has it changed the way that you operate at home um, and at work, like in the long term? We may have touched upon this a little bit, but I just want to kind of get: is there anything specific that has changed about your personal life, in particular? I tried not, as I said earlier, I tried not to make any changes to my life. I tried to be consistent because at some point it was, I believe it's all coming back. And I think, you know, if you're ready. What about your you art? Can... I bet it had an impact on your art, the type of art that you were making. It the did idea... a little bit, yeah. I mean, I was, I've was, i got a project that, an interesting real quick project, which is taking photographs of landscapes from movies, you know, because the only yeah. experiences that we could have were through, you know, those experiences were like National Lampoons when they're driving across the country. And I take yeah. a photograph of, of Monument Valley but it's from that movie and it would be called, you know, 47 minutes and three seconds, you know, and it was like, <laughs> I you love that. couldn't go there. So, so definitely had an impact there, but in terms of just keeping myself disciplined from every day and doing the same thing, it was almost like being like, being like a soldier ready for, ready for action. And I just want to ask you, um, because you're, you, you know, you, you have such a, a wealth of like knowledge and experience uh, as most of you leaders do, how does a young creative, um, uh, that maybe would love to like meet you and and work with you or admire you in a way that they want to have a conversation with you. How do you allow those people to to get to you? Is is there a mentorship program that you have, or do you, does you tell your secretary like you know if somebody ever calls, you just give me their resume, and if I like them, I'm gonna you know I, I want to meet them personally. Or how does that happen? How do people get get in touch with you? Yeah, there's that. There's internships. There's, <laughs> I would just, you, I would find me any way you can. Reach out to me. Um, I, I, you know, I, I kind of, I'm less inclined to kind of be solicited to by kind of companies, you know. And right, yeah, right. There's always, but but anyone who I, I meant creative. Sort of I meant, meant yeah, young yeah, creative. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Any social media you want to, you know, I would, I, I, I you know, I would definitely try my best to get back to them and have a conversation. I love it. Ideas. And still their ideas. <laughs> I love them. Stephen, do you want to stay on for a couple of more minutes um, while we say goodbye to the great, uh, very handsome Gavin Lester? Really, really Thank do you appreciate so much. your Thank time. You. Uh, Great to see so you. Great to see you. Thanks so much. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks again. Yeah. Thanks for everything, Bye. guys. Bye. Absolutely. We'll see you soon, Gavin. Bye. Next time I'm in Bye. LA. Bye. Yeah, absolutely. Bye. Stephen, so um, we might as well give you that question as well. So the pandemic, you know, how, how has it changed your, you know, your personal life uh, for better or for worse and, and also your work life? I think I just came back to the idea and I think we did touch on this, but I think it's really just about boundaries and it's about, um, you know, if I'm going to work three hours of the day, make them count. If you're going to be with your family, like try not to be obsessing over work. So the work-life balance is, to me, um, it's intertwined, but I think that mentally you you can draw lines. And I think I've, I've, I've gotten fairly good at drawing those lines or letting my family know when I'm, when, I'm in the, when I'm in the room working that this is happening, or if I'm preparing, I'm working late at night to get something done the next day. It's all okay as long as, you know, you're, you're in it and you're communicating. Um, yeah, I think that's I think that's that's one thing is is boundaries and I and I think the um and then obviously commitment within that within those boundaries is really um turning on and turning off and one thing we've been talking about a lot is um um emotional emotional proximity versus physical proximity which I think is really interesting because there's a lot of agencies that are trying to I think Gavin used these words about you know demanding that their people come back to the office and it's just kind of a it's a bad tactic, I think, to to make people feel culture or to try to um, reacclimate them into the office space, because I, I do think that I have great relationships with the people that I work with. Um, I know probably more about their, their personal life and what's going on in their lives than I did before. Yeah. So I just think there's a there's learning to be had about about all of this. And I think um, giving people you know, I, I work with with this guy who who's 
I, I watched his grandmother get sick and then she passed away and then the funeral and over an eight month period. And I was not there with him, but yeah. I was there with him. Like I saw this whole thing happen when I don't think I would have been that close to his personal experience um, otherwise. So it's a long winded way of saying that, that I care deeply about, right. About, about the people that I work with, but I also want them to not care at all about the work that we're doing when they're doing their thing. Yeah. So it's, it's just those boundaries and it's commitments to it all. I love that. I think it's important, you know, early on in the pandemic, I think um, a lot of the guests were talking about that specific thing, which was, you know, it was the first time that they were able to, uh, whether it was with the, uh, you know, the, the creatives that they work with or their staff or, or their clients, that they were able to look into a part of their lives through this screen and really feel who they were and get to know them in a way that they wouldn't have otherwise, you know what I mean? Right. And I think that's really just important. And also, um, you know, there was there was talk about uh, it's important for, uh, you know, people that work with you on your team see that you're vulnerable as well and that you experience things as a human being, which is the whole reason for 5 and 30, anything but advertising. So we can really know the real you. So it's important. Uh, and I think that's what you're saying. I, I mean, it's I, funny I, when you think about. I'm, um, yeah. I don't want to badmouth anything or anyone, but it's like you think about the corner office and what it represents before yeah. somebody walks into it. It's like, okay, now take that off the table and you've got a person with a person walking to that person to talk to them about a thing. You're right. You're not letting anything get in the way between. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I think taking those tropes off the table, I think are, I think hugely impactful and important. Yeah, I Able. agree. I love that. Um, I don't know how much time you have left. I have one more question unless you want to, sure. um, you know, I'm going to kind of like, uh, maybe I'm going to kind of go to this one where I think um, it's kind of a bonus question. I'm going to skip the one. I don't know if you looked at it, but um, there's actually two. One is like, you know, and this, I touched, touched upon this, like, you know, you guys being uh, art uh, uh, appreciatives, uh, you know, when we're young, I mean, when we're born, we're born with like, you know, we can, we, we imagine dragons and fairies and toads and colors and we can dance and we can do anything. And then again, like I said, the peer group starts like pressuring you and you become this other person that leaves this whole creative, you know, part behind you. So um, as we get older, um, you know, cause we do try to fit in. Um, what is like the thing that makes you stand out the most that maybe you know you you had when you were a child and you lost it because of peer pressure or just because you forgot about it but now like you know you're it's a part of your life now because of the pandemic what makes you stand out as you yeah that's interesting you know like when i was a kid i was a i was a um baseball card collector and i've always been just kind of a hoarder of things in order you know so it's more a little bit more of an OCD order than a, just a, a, a by chance. Um, but I think a curator. I think I'm, I'm, I've always been a collector of things, of people. And uh, with partners in crime, I I pride myself on the the quality and the, the 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 layers of people that I have at my disposal. Um, so I think that's one thing. I think that's one thing is that I I look at um, the the sum of it all as opposed to um one one person being able to do it all and i think that i think come bringing it back to me a little bit is, is it's just about creating an environment that um that is selfless that that can be collaborative that is creative because i think as a creative director and gavin would probably say the same thing but our big job our main job is just to create the environment so that other people can thrive be collaborative and um, and celebrate each other. And if you create this contentious, competitive, hierarchical environment, then it's it's I I think it's the opposite of of creative. So I've always been good about like letting you know of of working with with folks and working with people and 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 what my company now is 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 truly that platform where you know where I'm curating talent and people to come together to do their thing. And it's not sitting on top to dictate or to point fingers, but it's really about just creating a, a generous environment. 
read your article recently on the, the new way of working and I thought that that, that was super interesting because one of the things I think that happens in a recession time like this is that um, what was kind of a lot of power in the employees hands in terms of they were easier to negotiate salaries and you know as we were saying earlier benefits working from home all of this stuff that really is about to flip on its head and it's going kind to of become the employer who has all of that that power to dictate what their business is going to look like but I, I think it's interesting that you're speaking there about you know create you know should smart employers really be trying to create that environment that employees want rather than just thinking about what they feel they need if you know what I mean it is I I don't know I think it's going to be a level playing field I mean that's my hope is that it is a truly level playing field and that when a business makes a decision they're taking into account their the people who are doing the work they're taking them into account it's definitely been a power shift and a struggle and I think certain companies and certain people are going to end up doing something else but I think if the goal of what we're doing is to generate ideas and come up with art and come up with creative solutions for these companies to get out into the world and change culture and sell product and all that stuff that we do, then there's a way to structure that, that where we all win and we all make a lot of money and we all do great work and we all get to sleep at night and watch our kids' soccer games. Um, <laughs> Exactly. You know, but I, but I think if you're, if you're, you know, if, well, if you're, if you're a business structured a certain way to, 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 to make money a certain way, and you're trying to force employees into that world, then, um, yeah, I just, I don't know. I don't know how that, I don't know how that's going to work in a, in a sort of positive way. Yeah. I love, I love that. Um, just from this short period of time, getting to know you on this, uh, zoom, you know, I, I can see clearly this thread of, um, you know, in, in collector in the in the in the most inspiring way, but um, curator collector, you know, that led you to um, a model of a company, like you said, that allows you to curate the most creative, impactful, inspiring people that work for a specific thing. That's just unprecedented in a, in a way, as far as I know, and I think. Um, if, you know, if I were to be, you know, uh, in, in that, that, that field, um, I would want you to be the captain of uh, my ship as well. I think it's really, you should, you know, uh, I applaud you. Um, and, and I love how you've literally like kind of impacted your life with these layers, instead of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, you really just kind of built on this foundation from your childhood to your teenage years, to your, you know, the good be years to now, you know, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And I've worked with some great people and Gavin was one of them and yeah, had some, had some great, you know, great teachers along the way. Um, but I think we're all, you know, when it comes down to it, you know, you, you look at some of the best agencies out there, Crispin in its day. Yeah. Yeah. They had their great little team of people. I, I think back when I, when I worked at DDB in Dallas for Jim Ferguson back in the day, but, but we had like a nice little core group of people. We were all fairly junior, very junior. Yeah we were curated and we were put in flat place for a reason. And I think it is just about thinking about the whole as opposed to all of the individuals. And if a company is able to create that environment that invites these people into it, then, then you're leveling the playing field. Then you're giving, you're sharing, that's the culture. That's the, yeah, exactly. that's, what you're, that's what you're offering the people. It's like, you want to be part of what we're doing here because it is, it is special. And, and when, and when you're here, you represent something in as as part of the group so i think that acknowledging the individual and the importance and the impact that they'll have in the group is crucial and for the individual i think to to see that and to respect that it's not them that's going to come in and shake things up and you know and 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 maybe be that breakout star or start to move things around like let it be it let it let let's i'm okay being part of the whole like, yeah. I think you have to, there has to be some generosity on both sides. Yeah, well said. Well, um, Stephen, Goldie, uh, Goldblatt, uh, you've been a pleasure. Time is so important. And we really, really thank you for your time and, yeah. and all your inspirational um, words and thoughts. Really, this has been a pleasure. Um, yeah, it's been so lovely to get more time to chat to you just about you as well.